the YouTube live. That would be great. Welcome everybody to our event. Uh, my name is Rohan. I am the coordinator and counselor, one of the counseling faculty within our Send Promise Scholars for Men of Color, which uh, today, well, this semester will mark our end of our first year as a program on our campus. Um, so very proud of all of you students in here, these USN students and all you students that joined us today uh, through a very kind of, you know, very tumultuous year. Um, and we have, a, we have a couple awesome presenters here that we'll introduce shortly. Um, but we just wanted to acknowledge all of you students for, you know, for sticking through this year, uh, being the resilient folks that you are and, and getting it done, you know, and getting it done and staying connected with all of us. Um, we're extremely proud of you. We're going to continue to support you through the next year. Um, and, you know, that's what this is all about, right? This brotherhood, um, that's what we, us leaning on each other, you teaching us, and we learning from, we us all learning from each other. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge our Ascend Promise Scholars, Men of Color students, and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'll pass it to Trevor uh, to, to introduce our amend, because we're co-sponsoring this amend and ascend. So I'm going to pass it to my brother, Trevor Brackett. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brother Ro. I appreciate you. I want to thank each and every single one of you all for being here today, taking the time out, um, you know, today to, to, to you know, listen to our prolific speakers that, that we have today. I'm definitely looking forward. So thank you all so much. Also want to give a special shout out um, to my uh, um, to our uh, uh, men charter program that, that we have at PCC. So shout out to all the brothers that's on, on, on here and um, good job. This, this this term, you know, good good job for the year. You guys were doing phenomenal things, holding it down, you know, personal life and in school. So, um, you know, Brother Jamar, good work. I see you putting in work, you know, countless hours, making sure everything is, you know, is, is staying afloat and successful at PCC for the men charter. So just want to give you all guys a big shout out. Thank you, Trevor. Just wanted to also briefly shout out some of the amazing folks uh, that have helped make this possible, uh, starting with our staff, Jamar Walker, the Jamar Walker, one of our counselors, Juan Pablo Carrion, one of our counselors and Puente coordinator, Ricardo Rico, our career counselor, Jonathan Ang, our career counselor. Where's Brandon at? Brandon, Brandon, our MVP, Brandon Trujillo, our student success coach. Of course, Trevor Brackett, uh, our Dean of Counseling, Armando Duran, and last but certainly not least, the person who really made this program possible on our campus, uh, Dr. Cynthia Olivo. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Olivo. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's incredible to be here with all of you. And uh, I wanna turn, turn that right back around and say, thank you to you, Rohan. Thank you for your leadership, for your persistence, and for your hard work. It's, it's taken us a couple of years to organize and ensure that when we got this program started, it, was, it would be strong and it has been. So thank you so much. I also want to uh, say hello to my friends and my colleagues, uh, my, mis colegas here. I see Dr. Ed Bush is one of the audience members. Ed and I go way back, way, way, way back when um, we were both student activists and then um, starting out you know, in our careers. So I, I know for sure I wouldn't have gone from you know, my background to a PhD without the guidance of strong student activists and leaders like Dr. Bush. I also see my friend and colleague, Dr. Dural Foster. It's so amazing to see you here. Thank you. And then Dr. Bull, uh, you're just uh, dynamic, energetic. I'm so excited for our students to hear from you. And then I also see some students in the, in the group here today, uh, Michael Garcia. Uh, I, I also know that Miguel Beltran, it's just really, amazing to see that you're getting into the colleges that you were striving for. And uh, that's why we do our work so that we can help you make your dreams come true and achieve your goals. And what I love about uh, Ascend and Amend is that what we try and help do is build on the, um, the talents that you bring with you to our college and uh, make sure that you know when you 
are going through PCC and when you leave us, we want you to contribute to social justice, right? To keep that activism going so that it, we're not the first that we open that door and kick it open for everyone else that is from our communities. So congratulations. Thank you for your participation in our programs. I have nothing but love for you and I look forward to tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Olivo. Thank you. Um, and yes, thank you to our students. Y'all Y'all are the reason why, if it wasn't for you, there would be no Ascend Promise Scholars. There would be no Amen Charter. So y'all are the reason why we're all here today. And you know, we got mad, you know, we have mad love for y'all. So um, you know how it is. And so, you know, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce one of our speakers, Dr. Darrell Foster, and then Trevor will go ahead and doc introduce Dr. Bull. So I'm gonna go ahead and share his bio, Dr. Foster's bio with you all. Um, and here it is. Dr. Darrell Foster has been an administrator in the California Community College system for over 20 years. He is a student-centered leader with a proven track record of advancing educational access, equity, student retention, and success. He is collaborative in his approach to implementing institutional practices, behaviors, and policies that provide a positive climate on campus and effectively addresses the diverse needs of students. As president of Las Positas College, Dr. Foster is committed to providing strong leadership with a high degree of integrity, passion, and commitment to fully serving our students in a growing and supportive community. Dr. Foster is passionate about cultivating effective partnerships and promoting innovative approach, approaches to enhancing student success outcomes for the students at Las Positas College. Previously, Dr. Foster served as the Vice President of Student Services at Moreno Valley College, Dean of Student Affairs at Rio Hondo College, Associate Dean of Counseling and Director of Student Life at Mount San Antonio College, Director of Student Life at Evergreen Valley College, and Activities Coordinator at San Jose State University. In addition, Dr. Foster has served as a part-time lecturer in the College of Education at both Cal State University Long Beach and Cal State University Fullerton. Being the first in his family to attend college, Dr. Foster received his EDD in Higher Education Administration from the University of South Southern California, the University of Southern California, fight on. His Master of Science in Counseling, Student Development in Higher Education from Cal State Long Beach, and his Bachelor's of Science in Applied Behavioral Science from the University of California, Davis, where he also served as co-captain of the UC Aggies football team. He and his wife, Tammy, have two young children, Mylea and Dalen. Thank you, Dr. Foster, for joining us today and taking time out of your day to be here with us and our students. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. I appreciate it. Humbled and honored to spend some time with y'all this evening. Appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, we got Trev about to introduce Dr. Bull. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Rowe. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Foster. And I just want to just thank, you know, my, my um, amen brothers for, for always showing up and, and, and supporting us, you know, when, when we call upon them. So um, we also have, you know, Brother Herb English on here. Um, so thank you so much. I don't, I'm not sure if Dr. Levo seen you. I'm sure she would have shouted you out. Uh, right. So, um, you know, we talk about we talk about brother. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Levo. I'm sorry. Hi, go ahead. Herb. Hi. <laughs> We also know each other from back in the day. So it's great to see you here. Thank you for supporting. So one of the things we do, we, we talk about brotherhood, and, you know, we really stress and emphasize brotherhood between a sin and a man. And so, you know, by, you know, my men brothers, they lead by example, by continuously just showing us support and just really showing us the definition of what brotherhood is truly about. So just thank you brothers for, for being here so much. So I'm gonna go ahead and read Dr. Bull's bio. Uh, Dr. Bull is an award-winning professor, yeah, anti-racist activist, progressive practitioner, and investigatory educator. He is an innovative dynamic leader within the San Diego community and throughout the state of California. He completed his bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's degree in education with an emphasis in community-based counseling and social justice, both from San Diego State University, go Aztecs. He completed his doctor, uh, doctor work in educational leadership with an emphasis in educational psychology from the University of Southern California. Y'all everywhere. Uh, he's a professor 
<laughs> and Transfer Center Di Director in the Counseling Department at San Diego City College. Dr. Bull is also a lecturer at San Diego State University, where he teaches restorative practices and conflict transformation to the students in the Advanced Graduate Certificate in Mental Health Recovery and Trauma-Informed Care, MA in Education in Concentration and Counseling Program. He serves as a task force member on the Academic Senate for the California Community College Equity, Diversity, and Action Committee. As an active community leader, he serves on several boards and roles includes president of Marcaz Al Madina, a community-based nonprofit, vice president of the Somali community of San Diego, board member at large for MEND, a board member for the board for the uh, United Taxi Drivers Union in San Diego. He was the first Somali ever to be hired as a tenure track faculty member at Southwestern Co uh, Community College, where he served in the following roles, coordinator of the Emoja program, faculty chair of the Black Alliance, academic senate, senator for the School of Counseling and Student Support Programs, chair of the Political Action Committee for SCEA. In 2019, he was awarded the Golden Apple for being the faculty member of the year at San Diego City Community College. It is the first time such a recognition was given to a faculty member from the Student Services Department. In 2011, he has, um, he has the recipient of the Ocean Leaf Emerging Leader Award. He is a published researcher and scholar practitioner who uses social justice and activism as his guiding pedagogy for change. He has published articles, conducts research, and facilitates training on the following topics. And I'm telling you, he's phenomenal at these. Anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, curriculum trauma, Black male success, restorative justice practices, leadership and community development, parent and community engagement, and student leadership and activism. Dr. Bull has been leading statewide efforts in race conscious practices and anti-racism trainings. He is the second oldest of 13 and is a proud father to a two-year-old daughter named Salma and has been married for seven years to his wife, a nurse practitioner, Sodi. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Dr. Darrell Foster and Dr. Bull. Thank you, Professor Brackett, for that phenomenal introduction, man. I got a chunky that bio on the road, man. Uh, <laughs> for that, you that so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and turn it over to my big brother, Dr. Foster, to kick us off. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate the introductions. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's an honor to spend some time with y'all this evening. Um, certainly a pleasure to co-facilitate with, uh, with my brother from another mother, Dr. Bull, a fellow AMEND board member. So on behalf of the AMEND organization, it's, it's great to be with you uh, this evening. I want to thank PCC, Dr. Olivo, Dean Duran, uh, your team of amazing counselors who helped coordinate this event, Rohan, Jamar, and Trevor, another fellow AMEND board member. Um, I want to thank the um, Ascend staff and the Ascend Promise Scholars, the Amen Scholars, and the PCC family. So, on behalf of Dr. Bull and I, um, you know, we we just applaud the great work that you all are doing at PCC on behalf of your students. Um, speaking of students, we are we are so pleased and, and honored that that you are here tonight, um, and we're going to be talking about you. I mean, we're we're going to talk about some things that will allow you to gain a better understanding of of you and who you are and what you're about. And we hope that this will help inform where you're going in terms of your future and where we're going in terms of our collective future. So during this conversation, we're gonna ask you to do some reflecting. We're gonna ask that you're honest with one another, that you speak your truth. Uh, most importantly, we want you to be honest with yourself. Uh, so this is gonna be interactive. Uh, we're big on receiving feedback. So. Um, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, each person that's that's in the room today, just just type in the chat. How are you feeling today? How are you showing up in the space today, right now? So just go ahead and throw some some thoughts in the chat for us, just so so we know how you're showing up in the space today. I hear you. Be honest. That's right. Absolutely appreciate that. All right. So go ahead and keep those keep those coming, and, and we're going to meet you where you are. Um, but certainly, you know, we're energized by your collective presence. Uh, we're excited and we're looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Um, and so just to recap, 
I see many of you are, are mentioning uh, your honest, raw truth, feeling great, stressed, I know, tired, mentally drained, uh, but pumped for this event, overwhelmed, okay, burnt out, definitely feel you on that. And so it's been a, it's been a difficult year. A lot of y'all are transitioning between a pandemic within a pandemic, within a pandemic, right? Pandemic of COVID-19, some racial trauma, some unemployment, economic stress. So we're going to talk about a little bit how racism works and how that operates itself. Um, and then Dr. Foss is going to go over to about racial identity and how we then kind of, you know, inhale some of that uh, and how we actually take on some of that pain and suffering. And then we're going to hopefully move to more healing space with some guided questions uh, in about, you know, 40 minutes or so. So the first part, bear with us, is going to be a little bit lecture heavy because we got to talk about where the pain comes from, the source of the pain before we can heal we got to diagnose, right, uh, before we put our medical gloves on. So we're going to go ahead and talk about um, that. And, and as Dr. Foster mentioned, you know, just be cognizant of space in your breakout rooms and throughout this process. If you take away, don't take up space, well, today take up space. You know, if you do take up space, make space for others. Step up, step back. Um, also, some community principles is, you know, listen, learn, leverage. And as you're in your smaller groups, you can acknowledge, Armando, that was powerful for sharing. I may not agree with what he said, but I can affirm it, right? Thank you for being honest. Thank you for being vulnerable. Everyone has different lenses of how they operate and engage this work. Looking at intent versus impact. And ultimately, you know, we got hard work, but it's also hard work, right? Like today, I engage you all and welcome you all to do we do that hard work. Like healing requires a compassionate heart. And I want to leave you with this. I want to state this very, very important quote. As our experiences help us develop thicker skin, we always have to make sure our heart's always soft. Our experiences, our condition always, you know, give us thick skin to navigate these spaces, but our heart always has to be warm and soft, be empathetic, to be merciful, to be able to, you know, heal and cope. And so when it comes to racism, some of us are in different areas. Some of us are in the fear zone, avoid hard questions, deny it's a problem, right? Some of us in the learning zone. Today, I want you to kind of engage us in the learning zone. See that it's present. It's out there. It impacts whether you know it or not. How you think, how you feel, willingly or unwillingly, right? Uh, and in the growth zone, we've got to speak out about where it comes from. So that discomfort, right? Um, and don't let those mistakes deter you from, from being able to person. Because sometimes we actually unwillingly perpetuate those things. That's how, that's how we get colonized, right? Sometimes it's, it's in the mindset. It's in our minds. We, we may have an experience in K through 12 that makes us feel less than, and we start to really believe that. And so today, hopefully we can kind of, you know, cleanse ourselves of that mindset and actually be our authentic selves, your beautiful, raw, authentic selves. And so where does that come from? We're, so let's, let's, let's define racism. I'm very, very clear on definitions. So in the group chat real quick, I want to ask y'all, can people of color, y'all up in here, can y'all be racist? Yes or no in the group chat? Can y'all be racist? Part of learning is unlearning, right? Yes or no? Yes or no? I see the group chat lighting up. Yes, yes, yes. This is, this is gonna be fun. All right, all right. I love it. I love it. Okay. We're gonna play a quick video. Understand what racism is. Is audio sure good? Man. Come on, you know, you, you, you think you know. I'm not suggesting I know. I just have a couple of definitions that uh, that kind of came to me as I thought about it. How many people think there are white racists? Well, there are white racists out there. How many think there are black racists out there? Okay. Now, this is an interesting thing because this becomes important as we begin to define concepts. Now, I do that. I usually define concepts. Um, all the, all the way. But one of the things that I, I do is I try to help people get a picture of what I mean by, by racism. So tell me how it is. I'm going to first category is white racism. Then we'll deal with black racism. So white racism. Tell me the ways in which white racism adversely impacts the lives of black people. Just what are the ways that white racism can adversely impact the lives of black people as a group? What are some of those ways? I'm sorry, power, but how is that defined specifically? Education, okay. 
I'm sorry. Economically employment. What else? Housing. What else? Policing. Why are we here today? Healthcare. Okay. Now, we can actually kind of grow that list. Now we're going to move over to Black racism. Tell me the ways in which Black racism adversely impacts the lives of white people as an entire group. Thank you. The reason why you become silent, there's one that always comes up, and that's fear. White people are afraid of Black people. They are afraid of us. And it's a very interesting thing because Black people know it. We know white people are afraid. But you have to start getting into the psychology. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid? But it's an interesting dynamic. Now, also, you see the difference in what racism is, do you not? Racism implies you have not just prejudice, but the power to do something with that prejudice. Now, I don't like you, not only that, but I'm going to control whether you can get, you know, I may say I hate you. I hate white people. I hate them. I hate them. It's not going to change you getting that, you know, loan <laughs> when you go to the bank. You can go, you can hate, I can hate you all the way to the bank. Not going to change. You see the difference? That whereas white racism says, not only do I not like you, but I'm going to change the, the impact of where you can live. I'm going to determine with that racism where, where your powers are. You following me? And I'm talking about as a group, not an individual, because people said, I remember when my uncle didn't. I'm not talking about your uncle. I'm talking about the whole group. I'm not talking about an incident. That's a difference. But so this how is, many people? This is important, right? Because I don't want y'all to think that you all can be racist. Now, you can have some prejudiced thoughts you all can have some biased ideas, right? You may have some beliefs, right? Um, you may have some even interpersonal engagements. You may say things that are offensive or racist, but you don't have institutional power. And so part of the psychology and the pathology that causes the sicknesses in us is that we're often victims of racism. And then we're then told there's things like, such as reverse racism and we have this you know, un institutional power that doesn't exist. So we have to look at things from a structural systemic point of view, right? So for example, these are some racist things that you probably experienced. Black and brown, or men of color are not motivated to learn. You may have had engagements that were short in classrooms with professors, they didn't let you raise your hand. You asked questions, you were hostile, right? You were being, you know, um, erratic, suspended. You got the preschool prison pipeline, right? Enforced on some curricular trauma. And then you've had some funding. Thank God you have Dr. Levo there. She's probably always going to bat for y'all, making sure you get the resources and the support, right? At the institutional and structural level. And so we heard, we heard a lot of these things in the past. We've heard people say, black people are thugs, Mexicans are rapists, Asians eat bats, Muslims are terrorists. We've heard these racist statements, right? But these people did some interpersonal things. They asked, where are you from? Or go back to where you come from, or build the wall, or the cluster purse, right? We had anti-Asian violence and stop and frisk and random checks of TSA and the preschool prison pipeline at the institutional level because they weaponized those systems, whether it's border patrol, or homeland security, or education. And when they were in power, they were able to do things like put kids in cages, right? They were able to have mass incarceration, preschool to prison pipeline, Muslim man, because they had the power not just to say those things, but to do something about it. You see the fundamental difference now? We can call each other all the bad words that we want as possible, but there's no policy behind what we're gonna do, right? We can't put each other in cages. Right? And so racism has an element of power. And so we have to always understand there's a power dynamic and there's a white supremacy dynamic. So I hope that was kind of clear. So there are people that can spew all this, but once they're in power, they're in positions. If I'm a bank loan officer, if I'm an educator, if I'm a policymaker, if I'm a president of a country, I'm able to then enact this and literally say, you know what? Yeah, I can dehumanize you. 
I can strip you away of your humanity and put kids in cages because I believe that you are rapists. That I believe that you're three fifths of a human being. That I believe that you're an alien. I'm not even categorized as a human being, right? I'm able to strip that of you. And that's how that pain, that suffering starts from when you're stripped of your core of your humanity before it can start healing. Are y'all with me now? Hit up the chat if you're with me. So again, I want to define this racism as any prejudice against someone because of the race, when those views are reinforced by system of power, that's entertainment. Who's in the movies? What type of movies are they making? How are they depicting those people in those movies? Right? We talk about labor, we talk about law, right? System of police, and that's the one's pretty apparent out there right now, about politics and how that impacts that. Religion, we'll go into that. Sex, who's glorified, right? Who's not? War, which countries we engage in? Economics, who gets bank loans, who doesn't? Who gets to buy a house, who doesn't? And so Nellie Fuller Jr. says, if you don't understand race and white supremacy, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Even if you put people of color in the top of these positions, they're going to reinforce those systems of power. They're not, they're not advocating for black supremacy or brown supremacy or Asian supremacy. They're not. They're reinforcing white supremacy. So even if you put a person of power, of color in power, you have to understand that. And even entertainment, you say, oh, I'll have X amount of money. Colin Kaepernick had X amount of money, but was he the team owner? Could he sign his own contract even though he was a millionaire? He still got laid off, was unemployed. So where do these ideas come from? It's important. So now we have to diagnose before we get to heal, right? So they come from some of those glorified people, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. There were some racist assholes, I'm sorry for cursing, but I'm gonna be blunt with y'all. Some of the most glorified people in the world were the founders of democracy, quote unquote. They believe in climate theory. In California right now, the weather is good. They believe that hot or cold temperatures produce intellectual, physical, and moral inferior people. They label the Africans as burnt faces and the original meaning in Greek for Ethiopian was that. And they viewed people of extreme conditions, either super uh, dark, or super pale are subject to climate exposure. They used to call it climate theory. And that there were, the Greeks had the opportunity to civilize people, and everybody else was a barbarian. But you never heard about this Aristotle and Plato, right? There's also an individual named Gomez de Zarada. He was actually commissioned by Christopher Columbus, and the term slavery actually came from Slavs. You have to understand a lot of the empires, the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, they all had slaves, but they were actually Eastern European slaves from the Slovakian countries and Slav was short for slave. This individual in his book, The Chronicles of the Discovery and the Conquest of Guinea converted slaves and made it a specifically anti-black project because they wanted to do something with African slaves. And he wrote, he said blacks were Ethiopians, they were ugly and they lived like beasts with no customs. And that slavery was a good thing because we brought them into civilization. So he converted this whole concept of slavery into an explicitly anti-Black African project and connected the transatlantic slave trade, commissioned by Christopher Columbus. Let's move forward to the books that which you've read. There's an individual commentator buffoon. He believed that, going back to that religion piece, he believed that Adam and Eve were Caucasian and that other races were deformed, X-Men mutated, version of that because of the exposure to the sun and poor diets. This is the white supremacy and religion piece, right? And they can be reversed. So we talk about white as right, right? We talk about Samuel Sosa and Michael Jackson, folks bleaching themselves. That's not a foreign concept. And he believed that they can revert back to the original Caucasian race. And that was the default, was whiteness. Why is the individual important? Because outside of Aristotle and Darwin, he had the most impact on zoology and biology and naming organization, or organisms and plants. He's literally in our curriculum. Ivy League schools, Carlton Coons, professor at Harvard, University of, 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 of Pennsylvania, UPenn, founder of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, 
He believed that the darker the skin you were, the less intelligent you were. And he wrote a book called The Origins of Race, which segregation is used to think that people are morally inferior and use the term Caucasus and a white race interchangeably. But he believed that white people were superior to other races as they were more evolved with larger brains. Now, going back to how you feel less than, consistently and constantly, the founder of anthropology believed this. You've been taught this, or you've been, this has been reinforced by some of our education systems. And so, you know, Princeton says, hold my beard, Harvard. Hold my beard, UPenn. We can be as racist. We're the Ivy League of racists. We're going to introduce to you the field of psychometrics, Carl Campbell Brigham. He concluded blacks were actually intellectually deficient in native or inborn intelligence and lacked intelligence, period. He argued that it would lead to the decline of nations. He believed in eugenics. And he argued that Caucasians tested highest and immigration should be looked at to preserve American intelligence. Now, have you heard of the statement a couple years back, why are we taking immigrants from asshole countries? This is an Ivy League idea. He founded what's called the SAT that we use as a barometer of intelligence to gatekeep who goes to college and university. And so now our metrics of intelligence, the way we look at how smart we are, the SAT scores, was based off of a racist who believed this about people of color. Think about what that does to your psyche. And then look at how we don't even notice the language and how just anti-blackness it's completely metastasizing. We don't say power out, we don't say outcast, we don't say evil, right? Rejection, management, you're, you're a programmer now, black is beautiful. Well, how is that when you're hearing black male, black list, black ball, black magic, black market, black sheep, black out? The negative, 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 just reinforced. And so this does something to your psyche. It impacts you. It tears you down, it wears you out consistently and constant. And then we use pseudo terms, right? Ghetto, urban, civilized, savage, aggressive, divisive. And so I want you all to start processing how to decolonize and start healing your authentic self. Ask yourself, reflect on who you are as an individual. Who am I? Ask yourself, why do I think the way I think? Where do my thoughts come from? Are they from these other people? How do my beliefs inform how I engage this world? How do I know that's true? Reflect on yourself in relation to others. Why do I view my brothers as the enemy? Why do I have to size them up and look at them as in, in an adversarial manner? Why can't I just love on them? Why can't I just support and root for them? What makes me want to look at them a certain way? How can I ensure I love my brother? What ways can I display that? And then how then am I a participant in the system? And then once you start to see that, you start to get a little bit of agency, right? You start to look at your positionality, your power, your privilege. You start to come out of that. You start to challenge narratives of privilege. You're like, what? Why is it that a 12-year-old kid can be killed, a black kid can be killed for a gun, but a 17-year-old white boy can run around with an AR after you kill people? Right? We have to educate ourselves, increase our educational awareness, decolonize ourselves constantly. Our mind is going to liberate us. Have meaningful dialogues across racial lines. I think that you do with a send and a men right here talking to each other, brother from brother to brother, different ethnic backgrounds, building bridges amongst ourselves and across the aisle. But then we move beyond book clubs and we start to live racial justice, where we start to see the humanity in each other. And that's how you go from being woke to awakening your community. Being woke for yourself is good, but awakening your community and your peoples, that's where we gotta go, Ricardo. Right? It's one thing to have that conversation with yourself. Then with your brother, then your mom, the pops, 
Then with Michael across the aisle, now we're talking, now we're building. So we got to disrupt, dismantle, and decolonize. We got to say, am I still moving with the same business user energy? Like, why is it okay that white folks protest about they call it a party? The Boston Tea Party, they're out there looting. They're out there throwing taxes into the freaking, I mean, it took millions of dollars of, 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 of taxes, British taxes, dumped it into the ocean, Boston Tea uh, 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 Port, and they called it a party. But we took a couple of TVs out of a target, and y'all calling that a protest and looting? There was buildings burning. But it's funny, even the language that they used, they call their protest and their looting and their violence a party, the Boston Tea Party. You see what I'm saying? Like how they psychologically impact how we feel. So we gotta identify where those sources of power come from, where these things come from. And then we gotta actively decolonize ourselves. It's a diet. Part of healing is cleansing ourselves of the white supremacy that we've inhaled consistent and constantly. That's why I love Carter G. Woods. He says, those who have no record of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration which comes from the teaching of biography and history. So the wounds that are placed on us are psychological. And they impact your heart and your mind. And you start to feel your self-efficacy, your self-esteem, your self-worth. And so today I want us to really say, you know what? Fall back. Hold on. We done Looks like we might have lost. Did we lose Dr. Bull there for a second? I believe we did, bro. He's frozen up. I'll um, get on him via text, right? I just now. I just shot him a text okay, right now. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um, brother Foster, you kind of want to jump in or? Let me find that mute button. All right, very good. You know, um, I appreciate. Um, <laughs> I love the comments from our students. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that yeah. his energy was too powerful. The message was so strong yeah. that the internet itself could not even handle it. They couldn't take it. They couldn't take it, boo. You bringing heat? Are you back? <laughs> the floor? See you. He's back. He's All back. Right. <laughs> All right, <excellent. laughs> don't 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 you broke the internet, bull. You broke the home. internet. <laughs> The white supremacists that came through started messing up our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was at a uh, Guillermo Gonzalez, yeah? Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and how he was able to contribute at the age of 17 color TVs and his technology to all the way to Jupiter. But we're told black and brown genes hasn't done nothing to this world, right? We look at, you know, the microscope. X-ray reflection, we talk about vaccines and you know all the technology. And this brother, you know, Albert Albert Biez actually created this technology that we use today. We talk about even the, you know, Thomas Edison created the light, but light bulb, but the carbon filament is what actually made it, and that was done by a black man. Alexander Graham Bell may have got recognition for the telephone, but the patent was laid and the design was laid by this black man. Lewis Latham, but you expect us to think that we haven't contributed anything to society. How many babies have been saved through incubators? A brown man from Peru, Peru created technology to, for incubators. So think about black and you say black lives matter. We, black and brown lives more than matter. Black and brown lives save lives. Brakes, all of us drive a car. When you pump your brakes, go ahead and thank a Mexican brother for doing that. This brown brother named Victor Ochoa was also a rider. He had a $50,000 bounty on his head because he was part of the Mexican Revolution, but he created the brake system. Look at that genius, man. They don't teach you this because they want us to psychologically be devalued and demoralized. The pacemaker, IBM computer was created in over 26 patents by this black man named Otis Boykin. This brown brother from Argentina created the 
heart that allows people the artificial heart. How many people have lived because of this? Genius. And as he created the artificial heart, a black brother created the blood mobile. How many of y'all gave blood, received blood, had families that got donated blood to save their lives? The blood bank itself and the concept was created by a black man named Charles Drew. And so this is how crazy it was. He did this and then the Red Cross still was practicing segregation. So imagine developing the technology and then being told to go back in the line to get blood. Can you believe that? All y'all get to have fun sometimes, right? Not have babies. Go ahead and thank this Mexican chemist for that. Develop that birth control pill. They don't teach us this, man. I know some of y'all laughing. I know your parents are happy too. Like, we ain't gotta be no grandparents. Gas mask, talk about masking up. A, a black man named Garrett Morgan created the, the gas mask. Traffic signal. You got a Mexican brother creating the brakes and a black brother creating the traffic signal. You tell me black and brown men haven't done nothing in society? Come on now. And so when we look at the trauma and the way it works is that people kind of focus on the classroom, but you all come from an environment, home, family, but the media tells you certain things, social cultural reinforcements. We've got spiritual backgrounds. We've got psychological conditions in which we come from. And we engage our system through matriculation, through financial aid and assessments and admission and counseling and policies and procedures. And literally before you can sit down in a classroom, you've been exposed to so much. It just takes a lot for you to be here. That's why cherishing you being here this moment. It means so much. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Foster to take us to the second phase of our racial identity. Man, but I wanna leave you with the cool. fact that you are important. Dr. Wu, ah, students, how are you feeling? Go ahead and go ahead and put it in your chat. Uh, that, that was awesome. That was that was a great foundation uh, for for our conversation today. And really, you know, a lot of it stems from from frustration, right? In terms of the histories and what we're taught or what we're not taught. But we also want to make sure we provide you with some hope and inspiration. And so you have to know your history and you have to know uh, who you come from. So thank you, Dr. Bull, uh, for providing that perspective. Um, before we move forward, students, I, I want you to, to know that you are here for a reason. You know, by the end of, of this session today, uh, we want that reason to be clear. Something is gonna speak to you today. Something is gonna resonate with you. All of this may resonate, resonate with you today. Uh, so your charge is really gonna be based on the information that you learned today. How will you walk differently? How will you think differently? And how will you believe differently? How will this inform your actions and how you move um, beyond uh, this session today? You know, this session is called Healing as Your Authentic Self. And so in order to get to that place of healing, uh, you need to first understand your history, where you're from, who you're from, but also you need to understand your authentic self. And what does that mean, your authentic self? It means understanding your genuine self. It means understanding who you are. It means your true own personality, your spirit and your character. And that's what we're gonna get. I want you to really start to understand who you are and what you are about. And that also starts with understanding the, the context in which shapes how we see ourselves. And we're gonna talk about racial identity. So. I'm gonna take some liberties and, and really kind of provide what Dr. Bull shared with us and put it in some real life examples. I, I want you to know how I personally have kind of internalized this experience and I, I, I'm gonna trust that these are some similar experiences that, that you may have had as well. And so I'm gonna illustrate the importance of our life experiences and how they shape who we are. Uh, we all have a story. We've all gone through um, some challenging times. We all have had um, experiences that have shaped who we are to this point. And we need to acknowledge that. We also need to know how our history shapes who we are. As Dr. Bull said, we come from brilliant minds. We come from genius. We come from courageous and powerful people, kings and queens in our history. That's the narrative that informs who we are. We have to start with that foundation. It begins with our mindset and that who informs how we, we walk 
uh, in our everyday life. And so that foundation is really set by who do you believe you are? What do you believe about yourself? It's our frame of reference, right? It's our culture, our ethnicity, our gender identity, our family, our faith, our language, our neighborhood, where we grew up with, who we grew up with, it's our friends, it's our beliefs. All of that matters and that has shaped who we are. Our beliefs about ourselves and our beliefs about our identity shape who we are. So real quick, I'm just gonna share with you, you know, as I think about my own identity and how that shaped my frame of reference, I'm biracial, I'm black and Korean, I'm the first in my family to go to college. I'm the youngest in my family, have an older sister. Uh, my, my sister and my father were in the military. And, and I came up from a, a working class blue collar family. And when I got to college, I went to UC Davis. Um, I was a product of affirmative action. I was in the EOP program. Um, I was a, a financial aid student, um, went through the STEP program, which means I had to do a six week summer before I got fully admitted to, to the university. So at that point, I realized, you know what? I was invited to the party. They're like, yeah, you can come. But I wasn't supposed to dance. You know, I was admitted to the university, but I wasn't supposed to graduate. And so life has a way, and really our minds have a way with ensuring that we question ourselves. And sometimes that can be our own worst enemies. And part of that is what Dr. Bull shared with us is, is that history in terms of what we're taught about ourselves and what we're taught to believe about ourselves and what we see about ourselves. And that comes from the structural, the external, the racism, the white supremacy that we have to contend with on a daily basis. And let's be clear, that is our worst enemy. That's our external constructs. That is what informs how we can operate and move in this world. And that is powerful. But we also have to recognize that our minds are also an internal construct. Um, and that is also informed by the racism and the trauma that we've experienced, right? So what that meant for me is I, I had self-doubt. I questioned myself. I questioned my abilities. I had no confidence because I believed the messages. I believed the history. I believed the narrative that, they, that white, supremacy, white supremacy tries to sell to us. And I bought into it. I was also the first in my family to go to college. So sometimes when you are the first, and I know some of you are the first, however you want to define being the first, it comes with a heavy burden and it comes with a heavy responsibility because I was the first and my parents wanted all that responsibility for me to be successful was on my shoulders. I was the only one carrying that for my family. So there's a heavy burden and responsibility that comes with being the first. But when you have self-doubt, when you, when you subscribe to, and, and it wasn't no fault of mine, it's not a fault of any of you, it's, it's, it's those external pressures, right, that, that white supremacy has on us. It became a very difficult situation and one that, that you know, may not always turn out so well. You know, I had that self-doubt in college and it didn't just start there. It started, <laughs> it was my whole experience growing up. And many of you have had that experience. We learned and I learned and you learned at an early age that we are treated differently outside of our house. Life in our house was good. Life with our family is good. But once we step out of our family, we step out of our community, we are treated differently because of the color of our skin or how we look to others. And in a racialized society like the United States, everyone is assigned a racial identity, whether we're aware of it or not. Societies use, as Dr. Bull says, societies use race to establish and justify systems of power, privilege, disenfranchisement, uh, enfranchisement, and oppression. So racial identity is, is internally constructed and Part of my struggle was really trying to understand how do I identify myself? Who am I and, and how do I fit into this world, right? So I, I had that part down though, because I was pretty confident. You know, I was black and Korean and black and Korean and I was never confused about who I was. You know, I was never confused about my identity. I knew I was different from some other kids in my class. I knew that, you know, in my mind that made me unique. That was a positive thing. I was special, right? I, I still am special, that was, I am special, right? And that was positive, right? I had the best of, of both worlds. You know, Thanksgiving was always Korean barbecue, bulgogi, white rice, kimchi, mac and cheese, stuff and cornbread and honey ham. You know, that, that, was, that was my Thanksgiving. New Year's, we always had black eyed peas every year, right? And I, I celebrate Lunar New Year every year because my wife is Vietnamese, so we celebrate Tet. So I never doubted who I was or my, my, my identity um, but where I got confused and where I got confused is when I started to interact 
with others outside of my house, outside of my family, outside of my community. And I started to see how they perceived me and how they were treating me. So it didn't matter how confident I was in myself. I started to doubt myself because of the interactions that I had. And so I experienced racism early on, you know, in my neighborhood, uh, there was a kid, uh, Michael Hart came from a white family. He, he was privileged. He had, you know, he had all the Star Wars figures growing up, you know, and, and I would always go over there to his house and play. And, and one day he told me I couldn't play with him anymore um, because he thought I stole one of his toys, right? You know, I, I never stole any of his toys, but that's what he believed. And so I, I couldn't play with him anymore. It was also because I, I know it was because I was black, right? There was another uh, family in my neighborhood, Danette. Um, she, she's from a white family. She was my next door neighbor. And she told me that her dad said that she couldn't touch me because my skin color would rub off on her and that she would turn black, right? So these are images and these are things from, from an early age, right? That's informing how I see myself in this world, right? You know, I was in junior high and, um, you know, I had a girlfriend, Penny Clark, right? She was half white, half Filipina, right? And she was my girlfriend until her mom came home. And uh, my friend Robert, we walked her home from school. We were hanging out in her garage. Her mom came home and my friend Robert was Mexican. And uh, we were just talking and, and her mom pulls up in the driveway and, and she's like, oh, Penny, introduce me to your, to your friends. And she's like, oh yeah, I wanna introduce you to my boyfriend. And she points to Robert. And then she says, I wanna introduce you to his friend, Daryl. And she points to me. And all that was, was because she couldn't go out with black guys, right? So all of these experiences really shape who we are and, and how we see ourselves. Those are just some early examples of how others perceived me and treated me and how that impacted my racial identity. I know um, certainly that I was, I was special and unique and I always believe that once people met me, like if they just met me, <laughs> you know, once Penny's parents met me, it would be all good, right? It would be all good. But the, the, the crazy part about racism and about our society is that, you know, it, it took me a little while to realize that I wouldn't even have that opportunity. Like I would never have that opportunity to meet her parents. They wouldn't even give me that chance or that opportunity, right? So because of my racial identity and how others perceive me. So we've all had experiences throughout our lives, right? Um, not only personal uh, racism, but, you know, institutional racism, as, as Dr. Bull said, you know, uh, it rears its, its ugly head in schools, in stores, in our cars when we're driving every day, our interactions with the police, right? So all that played a role in, in creating self-doubt, a lack of confidence, and me feeling less than because of those experiences. So even though I was accepted to UC Davis in college, I was accepted through affirmative, uh, affirmative action. You know, the, the thing that I leaned on was that even though I, I had self-doubt, um, I, I started to believe and I understood, you know, that, that white supremacy wants us to think that there's something wrong with us, right? There's something wrong with us and that there's something special about them and that we're not special because of that. But our identity is, is key. When you don't know who you are, if you don't know your in identity, if you're not grounded in your history, or if you're not grounded in, in where you came from, then, then you're lost and, and that can often break you, right? And so you have to know who you are. You have to know that you come from genius. You have to know that you come from kings and queens and you have to let that define who you are. And you have to know what you're capable of and, and you have to believe it. Many of us, you know, when we learned it at early age um, and, and being around, uh, you know, others, we, we know that our histories and our ancestors uh, really have an impact on us, but we also know that we often have to work harder than anyone else to survive. We've all had those experiences where we need to prove ourselves. We often get our motivation from having to prove them wrong, right? Who is them? Everyone, right? It's, it's us, us against the world, right? Because not everyone believes in us, right? And, and most times people underestimate us, right? For assuming that we're not capable of, of, of being successful. So what we have to do Right? We have to flip it back on them. We have to use that to light a fire, right? That lights a fire in me. I, I get so angry when people underestimate me and they don't believe, they don't know me, right? They don't know what I'm capable of. They don't know who I'm from. They don't know who we be. They don't know my history, my culture, right? And that burns deep inside, right? So I always, I walk through life proving people wrong. I want to prove people wrong all the time. Like, please, 
underestimate me because you have no idea, right? You have no idea. And that's how I walk every day. So I know my racial identity and I need you to know and respect my racial identity. That's, that's how I walk, right? That's how your racial identity informs who you are and you get to be your authentic self. It's a journey, it's a process, but students, you, you gotta know that's what we're striving for. That's the confidence that you need to walk in this world, right? It's not arrogance, right? Arrogance is when you believe you're better than other people. Confidence is just you believe in yourself, right? You walk with confidence because I believe in me. I trust me, <laughs> right? So I'm going to walk confidently because I trust me. And you got to be confident in who you are inside and out. You have to be unwavering and unpolygenic. You have to be your authentic self. You have to be true to your personality, to your spirit, and to your character. That's what we deserve. And people need to know that. Dr. Bull, I'm going to turn it back over to you, my man. Man, th thank you, Dr. Foss, for that powerful testimony. You know, being from a first generation college student to a college president, that's what that confidence is, right? And that's, that's when we talk about modeling and, you know, healing and walking in this world and not letting white supremacy turn you down. They'll turn your confidence and make it seem like you're arrogant and cocky, right? Um, They'll take your misplaced and frustration and anger and make you seem better. And so support, you know, Dr. Foster reminded me of the fact that this beautiful quote, the truth will set you free, but first it'll make you miserable. The haters gonna hate, they're gonna be miserable when you heal, when you're feeling good, right? Because the, the lies suit them, but you less than. We talked about when you believe in yourself, your authentic self and you have confidence in who you are, that's going to set you free. We've got to unpack what's holding you back sometimes. And so healing is not linear, y'all. People think it's this thing that just you meditate, put some Band-Aids on, you know what I mean? Do your little rehab and you're good. No, it's, it's rough. It's back and forth. It's self-doubt. It's self-confidence. Dr. Foster mentioned there's some of these lies that people got to tell to have these scenarios, situations, and, you know, navigate things. And, and you start to second guess and second doubt, right? But ultimately, you hit this point where you're like, you know what? I love me some me. I love me some me. And it's not a bad thing. Right? We got to just be accepting the fact that we can just love who we are. We gonna love our swag, you know? When certain people walk, they got that little swag. We just gotta love that. Healing is that. Enjoying that. Embracing your culture. So it takes patience. And there's layers of those diseases that have to be stripped away. Part of that disease is the pathology and these wounds are, they're not as apparent because they're psychological, right? Dr. Foster talked about how confidence and arrogance can be misconstrued. You walk into an interview, no man, I got this. I feel I am qualified. I've got the experience, the education, and the prerequisite. This is mine. They'll make you seem like it's arrogance. No, 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 no. You got to strip that away in your authentic self. No, you, you did the preparatory work. You went to college. You did your internship. You, you prepared, this is your moment. You walk around there like, I, I wish they wouldn't give it to me. And that's not cockiness, that's confidence. That's, I love me some me. They get to love them some, some, themselves a lot of time. They're in the curriculum, they're in the TV, they're, they're everywhere. But we'd have been stripped of everywhere. So we're like, oh, you know, so we start to say, get, and we gotta strip that away. Because number three is everything for healing is already within you. You got to know who you are, right? I can probably, in order to know where you're headed, you got to know where you came from. You've got that power. You've got that magic. And there's many roads to it. It looks different. Sometimes you're like, oh, man, did I? You start to second guess and second doubt yourself. So we got to take away those psychological barriers from healing. And love yourself. And be your authentic self. And so... You owe it to yourselves because if you have an observation, 
we have an obligation, as M.K. Asante says. And I'll leave you with this James Baldwin quote. Where he says, imagine one of the reasons people cling on to the hate so stubbornly is because it says once the hate is gone, they'll be forced to deal with the pain. It pains them to see that they're causing you suffering in, in the healing work is something very, very important. We say hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. These people are hurting. They've got some inferior, they call it white supremacy. I call it white inferiority complex. Because best believe you start moving the barriers, oh, it's going to be a fair race. Oh, no, 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 no. If it's fair, I'm already, I'm already competing with you all these barriers. Now it's going to be fair. Uh-oh. Mm, you don't want that to happen. Right? So their pain and their insecurities, they place on people. And we saw that with some of these theories from these Harvard and Princeton. And, but then we're also making artificial hearts and blood banks and all these inventions. So how can you tell me that we haven't produced and created, right? So they have to deal with their pain. So we want to kind of uh, have a discussion now. We've talked enough. We need to hear from you all, Dr. Foster, because we're here for you. So here's some guided questions, and I can let Dr. Foster kind of go over these questions, and we'll go to a breakout room for about 30 minutes. Come off camera if you're able to. Um, have some deep, authentic discussion, and then we'll come back to the larger group and share from this. Dr. Foster? Hey, yeah. Dr. Bo Dr. Bull and Dr. Foster, sorry yes, to interrupt. Sir. Just wanted to make the announcement for our folks listening on YouTube, um, because this will be a, you know, to, to, to ensure confidentiality for our students and for our, each other and to have a safe space for appealing for all of us. Um, this concludes the portion of our presentation, our event uh, for the YouTube folks. We, we thank you for joining us. And thanks again, Dr. Bull, Dr. Foster. Um, and we're going we're gonna to go ahead and break. You know, I'm going to pass it to Dr. Foster here, but we're going to go ahead and have this space now for healing for our students and ourselves. Um, so thank you for joining us today, y'all. Uh, we hope you have a great afternoon, great evening. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. All right, so students, these, these are some questions. As, as Dr. Bull mentioned, we're gonna do a, a small breakout room. There'll be about